Chris. Christina, happy solstice. Happy solstice. What an intense one we're having. Something. I, I don't... Um, it was neat walking around our neighborhood here in San Luis Obispo last night. And the one thing that I had wanted to do and just didn't was get a pair of binoculars to look at the conjunction. And what was neat about it is that many of our neighbors had binoculars and or telescopes set up, right? It's like, well, of course, like there's community and then community supports each other. And like, Hey, do you want to come take a look at this? I mean, yeah. So it was uh, it was a neat experience for sure. I, I think it'll, sink in for me uh, as I'm still working and I've been while I'm on holiday this week what I am doing is I'm taking on one client a day um, and doing freebie sessions this week of whatever calls so um, yesterday was a past life regression plus in between life regression um Today was my own, right? And working in my own records. And tomorrow, uh, another client and then and so on and so forth with the exception of Christmas, which I'll, I'll work with Meredith on. But it's, um, it's playtime for me. So this is really, it's been a really interesting week and just trying to capture some of the energy and um, the newness, the renewal. It sounds like an excellent way to enjoy your time this week. Yes, and I love California, in case you didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> I see the mug. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So how did you um, bring in the solstice this week? I did do a meditation. Okay. And I did do some pre-cleaning of my mm-hmm. home. Because I, I know that this uh, uh, energy is very good for cleaning things out and for doing pivots little pivots here and there. So uh, nothing too major for me, nothing too manifesty, but um, definitely a gratefulness that I wanted to bring in and a focus on me because I am worth celebrating. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How about you? I mean, I, I know that you enjoyed some of the telescopes and binoculars that were set up, but other than that, what'd you do? Yeah, and both um, literal and metaphorical. Um, I, I did my own special work yesterday and, and had some interesting experiences. Um, and you and I had some time together this week as well. And it's interesting for me, to, and, and I don't do much on Instagram these days um, for many reasons. My social media profile is really, really um, scaled back during this time. And, and it's not that I, I don't have anything to say, but I'm really trying. It's like not everything needs to be shared. And there are these, um, these moments or these things that are really precious and intimate and feel um, special, right? And I, I want to keep those right here. And, and I know that in due time, you know, what I want to share and, and the work that I'm, you know, here to do and doing will be revealed, but it's as if I'm carrying um, a baby and during these nine months of gestation, I just want to experience what it feels like to go through the first trimester and the second trimester and the third trimester before bringing it into this world. Um, There's a lot, right? And so the solstice, and this came up in the work that you and I did together on um, what is today, Tuesday. So it must've been Sunday, I guess, right? Right. And how do we define um, solstice. And, and I guess where I was going this on, on Instagram was, you know, and it can get incredibly um, overwrought with spiritual language or new agey language. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, and that's okay. It's just not for me. You know, when, when I'm referred to as a light worker, it makes me cringe because 
it's as if putting a personalized license plate on my ass and, and I, and taking on this identification that I don't necessarily want to use and, or limit myself to, or ascribe to, but with the solstice itself, another interpretation or definition is, um, stillness and sun, right? So the Latin word soul, meaning sun, and sister, which is to stand still. And when I think of sun and being light, <laughs> it's and 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 being still and in your body and not busy doing or running to and fro or working on this or writing that or just doing, 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 doing. And just sitting with that light and that, uh, that spark that sits inside the one that we carry. I really wanted to take the opportunity to just stand still with that this week and experience that light and recognize that I'm ready and I feel calmer. I feel more self-assured. I feel as if I have much to contribute but if nothing happens, that's okay too. When I say that, I've spent much of the past week um, diving into my genetic ancestry and I didn't expect for this to happen. It just it was a notion, I did it. Um, but around Black Friday, the 23 and me served up an ad and it was like 50% off. So, and I was less concerned or interested in my genetic makeup, which I just assumed was going to be Polish and Irish and Swedish. And that was that, and unless it barring any surprises, uh, which was which largely held true, but I was really focused on the health aspects and what do we carry genetically that we may be predisposed to, or may pass on to our kids or our grandchildren is really awareness because there's so much that we can't control, but some of the things that we can control uh, because I, I like living and I like being who and where I am. I want to make sure that I'm taking care of myself, but it did open up or not, but, and it did open up um, this wormhole of genetic ancestry <laughs> and it's like okay so i'm piecing together like who my dad's grandparents were on both sides and one of them stops pretty short um meaning with his his grandparents and there's not a lot to to track and i haven't just haven't figured that out yet but his m on his mother's side, but his dad's side was, was large. And what I didn't realize was that he was, he was half Irish and half Polish. I always thought he was 100% Irish. And then you can go back to like the 1700s or late, late seven, mid to early 17th century on that side. And then my mother's side was really interesting in that not much about her or her parents but this goes back into the 15th century on one side. And there was a, uh, like a St. John one who was in Tudors, John Fisher was beheaded by Henry VIII um, for, um, for his writings and where he was pushing back against Henry VIII and, and his doctrine with the uh, church of England. And then on the other side, it went back um, into the 16th century and it was largely English. So, like the, one of the women was the first white woman born on Nantucket. There's another story about this guy, oh. Reuben, Reuben Paget, who um, was a pioneer. And he took a flatbed down the Mississippi from Illinois down to New Orleans with his friends uh, to join General Jackson's army. Got there, realized there was nothing. 
Um, and ended up, there's a story about him killing a native American. I'm like, wow, like there's, there's all sides, right? So it was um, on the, uh, the South, the North, the colonial parts of the revolution, um, those that were aligned with the crown. I was like, okay, this is, this is interesting. Um, but the more I've dug into it and sat with this practice yesterday, <laughs> it's like the family tree goes to here back. Let's call it like 500 years. But yesterday, and I was thinking about it and thinking in the experience of awareness and anxiety, the things that we're predisposed to genetically uh, that we still carry through and because I am 25 not 25% Neanderthal, but I have as much Neanderthal in me as 25% of the population. Oh. And it's like, well, holy shit. This story goes back 150,000 years. So what was demonstrated to me yesterday, was like, it's just the tip, right? Of right. what we're able to trace and track and largely irrelevant. It's interesting storytelling, but spiritual lineage is far more compelling to me. And so while I'm in the state yesterday and noodling on this epiphany of there's more than just the last 500 years, there's a hundred thousand plus years of homo sapien sapien in that comprises me the, the, the biological sense (laughs) <laughs> and it's like, well, let me just take me back there. Let me see what this is like, because we can do that. Right. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm laying there and my eyes are closed and it's like, well, just dial it up. I said, what's it like? Cause it just take me back to what that time was like so I can experience it. <gasps> and the first thing I heard was laughter. And, and it, it was like a village and there was laughter and babies crying and people talking and fire. And it was like, wow, like not much has really changed in that sense. But what did change was this is during the daytime. So when I get there, there's, there's water, it's green, it's beautiful. Um, I certainly had, you know, darker skin um, than I did today, but it was just a, a moment in time. And when I pulled out and I said, well, what's the downside to this? Right. And then it became night and night was when everything took on a different feel and that there's noises, there's animals, there's predators, and you're still, and you're trying to sleep and someone has to keep the fire going because fire 150,000 years ago, I would imagine, you know, it was, widely used, but probably just being controlled. So fire can scare animals. It can burn fur, right? It can burn feathers. It can burn humans. It can also cook food and protect. And then I, I'm in this like forest setting and it's like, wow. So it really was survival, right? And so as we're sitting and having and, and sharing this meal and and it felt so present and in the moment because you're literally hand to mouth or the, the experience is that you're literally hand to mouth and okay, this animal has been slaughtered. We're cooking it, we're eating it and we're going to do the same thing tomorrow and we're going to wake up and try and survive and go follow this herd and we're going to go. So th- there's a lesson there for me in presence and being present and that much of the anxiety that we experience as a population today and some of these um, responses with what's going on with COVID, it's, I can't get Trump out of my head, but, and how we have these um, baked in reactions and this fear and the sense of lack and protectionism, it all makes sense. So this little history lesson that I went through yesterday did provide some pretty significant context for me and understanding Um, and compassion. I mean, certainly for others and what you might read or see or experience when you open the paper, but to understand that this is not just the last 70 years, this is the last 100, 150,000 years of 
learned behavior and patterns and algorithms that we have running through our head and through our emotions um, that take time to unwind. So anytime that we as a species or a population are able to take pause and elevate above that or beyond that is a huge victory. Um, another thing that came up was around communication. And my friend, um, Mary Liz Bender is just a beautiful musician, um, a beautiful individual. And I was listening to a piece of her music on SoundCloud. It's instrumental and similar to like a Brian Eno type of feel. And as I'm listening to this piece, um, another song came in from, it was a Bob Dylan song, which was interesting, uh, but it wasn't Bob Dylan singing, it was a woman's voice. <laughs> and so when, I, when I'm hearing this uh, music and, I'm, I'm, and this inspired me, I was presented with this really interesting situation, Christina, where as I'm walking around my neighborhood last yesterday evening, so let's just call this before, before this experience of laying down, and I run into uh, one of the gentlemen that does the maintenance around here. And when I saw him and I wanted to greet him like, like this, I was like, greetings, blessings be upon you. Right. And then like, I wish you, I wish you well. And I was like, wow, like I can't actually say that. Right. And I mean, you could, right. Depending on and how you want to present yourself in this world, but that's not, that's not my thing, right? That's not how I'm going to walk around. But and when I'm listening to this piece of music and how much it's communicating to me vibrationally um, and in a non-verbal way, because we know that words are probably the least effective form of communication, right? And you're, it's really limiting. And it was like, Chris, suppose that there's a moment in time where you're not allowed to speak. And like, you've seen what this is like before, where you have a muzzle on you and you're not allowed to share how you feel or share your thoughts because it's dangerous. And this goes back to that tribal experience, right? And right. Where, um, you're, you're forced to deal with someone in the tribe. You don't want to be the one that sticks out like a sore thumb because you depend on each other for survival. And so it makes sense and it stands to reason why you don't want to rock the boat. Um, but even as recently as, you know, um, you know, the rise of the third Reich in Germany or any of these other, you know, authoritarian governments where you're, you have a muzzle on you and it's like, wow. So how do we then begin to communicate with each other in a way that is nonverbal with intention and I said, well, I can't tell Ray, the maintenance guy, you know, greetings be upon you, right? And all of your relations, I can certainly feel that while I'm communicating with someone. And I was like, well, and then I took it a step further. And I said, well, is there a way for us to communicate in art, right? Or using... Um, um, forms and shapes to be able to generate a vibration as well, which the answer is, of course. And, and I'll have to put this up there, but what, and this is coming back to the solstice. And then they gave me an example of what this looks like. And it was a pin, like a pinpoint. So, so like a dot. And then underneath that was a triangle. So the dot being the light and the triangle being, you know, the the standing, the, 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 uh, the stillness of it. <laughs> and so that as I see this, you know, in my meditation, it, um, it was the light, right. And like, and being able to communicate this, um, this responsibility um, that we have to ourselves and to each other. And then as it zoomed out, of course, there was another one and another one, and then 10 and then a, a thousand and then 10,000 and then a million. And there was just, a million points of light. And I thought about George Bush and started laughing, but it was, um, it was a, it was a really interesting um, stretch of meditations that I had and really wrapped into this 
or culminated in this uh, tapestry that was presented to me or that I saw. And <laughs> so the, it, it gave me the macro, which was this slow moving field. And I was like, wow, it just it felt very peaceful, very loving. And then it was like, well, what's turning everything? Like, what is, how is this happening? And it then gave me this example of myself as a small gear that's just slowly turning things. So the, the, the small gears are running really fast to turn around the bigger gears um, that are, you know, moving the multiverse. But the, and then it was all just part of this beautiful tapestry and the, the strength of being this thread, um, this beautiful thread, which is part of this beautiful tapestry of us. And that without that thread or without your thread or without Trump's thread or without Fauci's thread or without, um, you know, Maduro's thread, the tapestry is not the same. It's not as strong. And it became very obvious to me that having the awareness of space and the macro, the big picture is incredibly important. But to also remember that the fine sands of action are as important and are commensurate with the awareness of that space. So now that I have this reference point again, visually of the, the doing, 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 doing an activity. Um, but as it contributes to the overall space, it ended up being a very powerful solstice for me. And the redefinition of that was elevation, prominence, stature, and pinnacle of light that we all are. And just to honor that and carry that into the next moment. I feel you. When you said all of those, I could feel the vibration just mm -hmm. come at me when you were saying those words. Yeah, you know, about communication. That's very interesting because as you were describing you know, about how the limits of words can affect communication. And it's not very effective. I often have <laughs> a problem with interpreting the vibrations and the energy that I feel and can understand so clearly into words. It is so hard. And I think I've had, I think I've said this problem working with you as well. I'm just like, oh my I can see it. I can feel it. I can understand it. I just don't even have the words to put together to communicate what I'm getting because sometimes there are no words. And, you know, I do speak Korean relatively, relatively well. And of course, English is my first language. And there are some things that are so much easier to say in Korean than English and vice versa, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. I think a lot of people that are polyglots or bilingual can also say that, that this would be true as well. And I think that language and cultures, you know, language has evolved like we have really. It has evolved based on the influences of the environment around it and has changed. And look at South and North Korea, which I can hear the big difference between North and South Korea. And they just fought, what, in the 50s, yeah. 70 years ago? It wasn't very long ago. And the language is totally going in two different directions. Mm. 
South Korean Korean is it does have a lot of English based words like computer is computer, but in, in North Korea, it's another word completely and, um, and so on, you know, because they're, they're closed the outside world and their accent hasn't really developed. Um, it's, it sounds very, very strange compared to a lot of the accents in South Korea. So my point is vibrationally, I think there is communication happening based on the experiences and the environment that you're in. I remember when I was a teacher in Seoul, I got, I had something happen in my throat. I had laryngitis. I don't know, but I couldn't speak. It hurt to speak. I was sick, but I was at work and I felt good, except I just couldn't talk. And when you're a teacher and you're supposed to be in front of the room, it's really difficult. So it's very interesting how human nature just kind of pipes in. Usually I, before that, had been, you know, allowed to get everyone's attention, to get everyone on board, to get everyone moving in the same direction. But on that day, I had to whisper. And so I whispered everything that I needed. Now, I did have a couple of helpers in the class where I'm like, okay, you're helping, you're helping, come help me. But I'm like, okay, here's what we have to do. So as I'm whispering, everyone else started to whisper too in response to my whisper. I brought the vibration down to a whisper and it was human nature that they're like, teacher, can I go to the bathroom? And, <laughs> and I'm like, you don't have to whisper. Yes, you can go. We had the most peaceful classes that week. Because I brought the vibration of the communication down and the energy level went way down and everyone mimicked me and everyone followed me. So I think that really put an idea in me, which is I want to be a great communicator, even without speaking in words, right? If I can exude that kind of vibration and communicate non-verbally how I desire to be communicated with, I feel like that is also um, kind of um, something that people might mimic back to me. You know, a lot of people do mirror the person that they're communicating with. And I feel that it's completely possible. I've kind of proven it <laughs> myself. And yeah, so I, I think it's it's very interesting that you brought that up. And that's how I feel about that. It, well, what's interesting is that this was actually sparked by you. And I was going through my, my show notes from our session on Sunday um, where Christina was coaching me. And you said, you know, me, Chris, giving out energetic blessings for the holiday season. Oh, I do remember that. Yes. Yes. And I was like, well, it's so yeah. So it was just, it was filed away under easy listening. Right. And then that's <laughs> what the experience was yesterday. And, and how do you do that? And I'm aware of the fact that I, I do do that where people can feel my energy. Um, when I walk into a room, um, it could be a barista at the coffee shop, um, or it's like this big ball of plasmatic energy that just, I can feel it leaving my body and going into someone else. Not often, not all the time, but it does happen. And so now the difference is bringing intention into that and not expecting, you know, to feel that plasmatic ball of energy leaving, but how do you that, and this is a rhetorical, but s serving as this beacon, this light of compassion and solstice as we just defined it. Yeah. Not a bad week, Christina King. No, yeah. not a bad week. I'm in, as you know, I'm in a group therapy setting 
and I have been for a couple of months now. Mm. And I am leaving the group therapy setting because my insurance <laughs> it's running out. But one of the things that they told me now, remember, I am a client. I'm not a lead. I'm not a leader there. Um, and we have a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds. They said, we're very sad uh, to see you go. We know that, you're, you know, you are ready to move on, whether or not insurance kick, has kicked us out or whatever. Um, but actually, you're really good for the group. And I said, well, thank you. Now, that would be like, and of course, to some people, it's like, well, I mean, yeah, you're kind of a spiritual, energetic, like energy kind of person, which is true. But then she said, it's because you just kind of get into this like zone of authenticity and, you know, you just kind of put it out there and it, it's actually pretty inspiring to others where now they're all doing that and they didn't really do that before. So, you know, in, in essence, because you have been just kind of like, you know, aligning yourself and pushing yourself out there and everybody, you know, the group has started to do that as well. And now I thought that the group always did that, but then again, I wasn't there before. <laughs> right. So, so, so they did say, well, you're good for the group. We, but, and we also feel like you do get a lot out of the group, which is very true as well. Um, yeah. So I think you're right. I mean, you can just walk into a room with intention with purpose. And I think adding the element of being yourself and not really apologizing for it to yourself or to others, you don't apologize. Mm -hmm. You just live the best version of yourself and put yourself out there. It does take a little bit of vulnerability. I think even just in the, in daily life, uh, I don't think you have a problem with that maybe, but <laughs> You know, a lot of people do. I think, you know, if I, if, if I think about it, why are people bad communicators? Well, it could be a multitude of re reasons. Mm -hmm. It could be anything from, you know, neurons in your brain. Or maybe you're born to be a bad communicator. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you have autism or something. And, you know, that that's different for communication. And you know, there could be biological reasons. Uh, but there could also be, which is what I'm interested in, the spiritual reasons of why you're not communicating as you should. Maybe you're experiencing a bad time in life. Maybe you are hiding something from others and or yourself. You know, um, so along those lines, it's it's pretty, uh, in, I, I like to think about those things because I feel like that's kind of our work too, is to help people authentically align themselves so that they can accomplish great things, especially communication. <laughs> communication is pretty key. If you can learn how to communicate in any way, I mean, things get a lot easier for you, I think, in your life. Yes. And when we were living in villages or traveling and following the herd, we had to communicate. There was no place to hide. Right. And if, if you were the weak link, much like the, you know, the, the sick or old gazelle, you were gone. Right. You just, you weren't going to survive. And is I think you were forced to deal with things in that particular moment, right? And as they would come up and you had to communicate, there was no hiding. And it's not that we've lost that, right? It's just that the circumstances have changed and we've not evolved as rapidly as the circumstances that we've actually created around us. And yes, coming back to the solstice, there is an expansion of human consciousness. However, there's always been an expansion of human consciousness. Tomorrow is not different than today than was different from yesterday, right? Things are evolving. Now, as more and more people wake up 
to <laughs> like swallowing the red pill in, in the <laughs> matrix and understanding that suffering is optional, right? And, and how we react and interpret these circumstances, the circumstances don't change. You know, there's always going to be someone who cuts you off in traffic, but how we respond to these triggers is entirely within our control. And the it's it's really interesting to me to then think of how this expansion of human consciousness can happen with the way that we communicate in nonverbal ways because it forces us to really connect. And it's like if I can say more, communicate more by actually saying less. I'm going to give that a whirl for the next, you know, week or two. And it's like, wow, what if I were just using images? And then I'm, I'm back to drawing, you know, images on um, cave walls of, you know, large animals or mushrooms or aliens or whatever, you know, you know, these, these beings we're drawing, but there's, I think that this expansion of human consciousness in our experience, isn't that we're going to get bigger, better, faster, stronger, it feels to me as if it's going to happen because we learn how to better understand ourselves energetically and the connection that we have to um, each other um, in a vibrational way. And, and I guess that does sound then very new agey, but it's what feels appropriate and it's what feels right. And you, I can, say that it sounds new agey, but when things are right, you know it. And how do you know it? It's because you feel it, right? So these sensations of rightness, these sensations of where things are aligned are reference points that we can carry into our everyday experience. It's not intended necessarily to be how we walk through this world um, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year but it does give us a reminder of what's possible. Yeah. When you were talking about your experience going back, what, 150,000 years, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. You were, in, in theory, and I'm saying you as a collective whole, as, as a people, you were, you didn't have a phone, <laughs> you didn't have television. Think about how connected to nonverbal communication everyone was back then. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a reason that all of these Native American, you know, indigenous groups have all of these histories and theories and um, communications about things that happened long ago and 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 stories of of how trees can talk and and how the land can tell you something. I mean, it's all true. And people think that might be nuts now. A lot of people do. They're like, what? <laughs> Trees don't talk. They actually do. And we used to do that. We used to listen to trees. And now people have gotten away from that because it's almost like you're just so inundated with, with just messages and other things just constantly. And it's this... Um, it's almost like an addiction maybe where you have to be stimulated with this, this high energy intensity coming at you all the time. I mean, look at the kids. I mean, everyone's watching TV. I was saying all kids, but you know, I, I grew up on TV, but I, when we didn't have the internet like now, but now it's like TV and everybody's on their phones and everyone's playing music and things. But if you take it way back, I mean, just think about it. Think of all the things you could pick up on. There are people, I think nowadays, that actually expose themselves to nature in a very extreme way. I, I actually watched some YouTube videos on it where people will look at a beetle and because they've observed this beetle, they know exactly when the beetle is going to change directions 
before it changes directions. How do you know that? Well, I mean, you can watch it, but you can also experience the beetle up close, up in person. And I'm sure there's a little bit of vibrational exchange going on there. I'm quite sure of it. And, and think about the trees and think about animals. And even, I remember, uh, you remember Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter? Of course, yeah. Oh, I miss that guy. I watch his, I, I still follow his family. But I remember him speaking about his dog. Well, first of all, I mean, he knew animals very well because he observed animals. And I know, um, I'm pretty sure, I can't say no for sure I wasn't I, with him or, or him. But I'm quite sure that he had some communication going on with the animals that he was capturing and helping, things like that. Uh, I remember one of his interviews, he had a dog named Sui. And he said, I don't even have to talk to Sui. I just look at Sui. Our eyes meet and we know what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. And they were swimming and something happened. I don't know if it was an animal or whatever. And he, they both made eye contacts and, and they both knew exactly what they had to do. So the dog went and did her thing and Steve did his. And whatever crisis had come up, they dealt with it without speaking, speaking. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, and it, but it makes sense. And, and so how is this not woo-woo, right? Where... You can, I'm not sure what the Japanese word is for this, but where you can go into the forest, take, like, go forest bathing um, and, and pick up on this. So today in the same, through the same meditations yesterday where I had the experience where then at nighttime, you know, it was in the forest and there's, there's, there's things, right? <laughs> there's, there's the, the mythology, there's things falling from the sky. There's, there's things that were more easy readily perceived than than they are today and and why is that possible well we can go back to quantum physics right and when things are made up of electrons neutrons protons they all have their own you know energetic frequency right they're all on they have their their wave functions that it just makes sense that they have their own vibration so if you have a heightened sense of awareness that you can at least sense that there's something going on. And so can you talk to trees like Siddhartha? I mean, sure, right? And everything's got something to say if you're able to listen or if you're willing to listen. But today I, uh, I grabbed Meredith and we went to this forest um, in Los Osos or towards Los Osos from San Luis Obispo. And just th today was the day to go do it for some reason. I'll send you some pictures and it's called Los Osos Oaks. So there are ancient oh, oaks. I want to see that. And it's just amazing. Um, but as we were, were walking through there, we'd never been, there's no mapping. We just put on our shoes, got in the car, left the kid in front of the TV and, uh, and, <laughs> and her and I went. And walking as we get out of the car and you see this huge oak tree and I always thought that oak trees were were straight and just big and powerful and once we moved up to central coast at least you know to ride out the pandemic and my experience with the oaks up here is not that um, they're huge sprawling um, it looks like the root system is actually just above ground they're, they're gorgeous and as we are walking, you can start to smell the earth because it's damp there, right? It's pretty close to the ocean and you can smell the earth and the different um, scents. And then there's moss hanging down from the trees and it was otherworldly. And um, the first path was called Chumash um, Trail. And then from the Chumash Trail, we had an option to go left or go right. And left was Los Osos Creek Trail and to the right was Oakview Trail. So we went Oakview Trail, and as soon as we banged to right, this is like, like I felt it in my face and in my shoulders. And as I'm walking through this, and I just I wanted to, I guess in a perfect world, what I would have done is just sat with it and just you know and just been there. That wasn't what was going to happen today, um, but I could just feel it, and so I just took that Earth energy with me throughout the rest of the walk. And I'd asked Meredith, because she's pretty sensitive. I'm like, did you feel that? And she's like, no. Um, 
it's like, okay. So I was just like, what is it? And it was, we were just being watched. Right. And it was like, Oh, you can feel us. Like, like, yeah, I can feel you. Right. And it wasn't um, malicious. It was just curious, old forest energy. <gasps> and as I look off to my left, I saw like feet moving. Right. And so there was like, like light, beings off in in the forest just like out of the corner of your eye um, which is how those things tend to be right it's like they're just kind of teasing and toying with you like i'm over here you know it's not like you know i mean you see things slightly differently than i do yeah i do i've never experienced this this is why i'm like fascinated but it's just like light and it's like it's like oh it's kind of feet and so as it's happening i'm just i'm just really um honored that I, I can have those types of experiences. But then as I was walking, I'm like, wow, I bet if I had actually sat there right under the tree on a log and just sat, like, I mean, something really uh, powerful would have happened. So that comes back to the stillness. And that's something that I need to continue to be open to. But coming back to the dog, Christina, you know, Kingston and I have a very special relationship. Um, I walked in the house and Kingston like runs to his crate and starts shaking. <laughs> you brought that shit home with you. <laughs> yes. I was like, okay, I said, I'll be right back. So went in and you know did a little um, energetic removal. I'm like, you know, y'all don't need to be here. Thanks for coming, but this isn't your place. And then before this, we were laying on the floor just petting each other. He likes to pet me with his arm. It's just Aww. The yeah. um so the this connection to nature is is new for me again and something that I don't want to let go of even when we do go back to Santa Monica or go back to Los Angeles um it's it's awoken something in me that has been dormant for probably 30 years and if I didn't have the ability to get out and go for these hikes or walk the trails or go walk through ancient oaks be a much harder pandemic for me um, than it actually has been. But my, I'm really incredibly grateful um, for the experience that we've had up here um, and the people that we've met and, and having afforded ourselves this opportunity to really connect with, um, with nature and with green uh, in a very real way. And I've spent so much of my life looking up at the stars and have been less inclined to look down into the center of the earth and realize that of course being here on earth is the divine experience uh, because we come from stars i've seen that transformation in you by the way because when i i remember working with you for for the first time and then now you've become quite the earthy guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like before, I think the first visual I ever got on you was you as an astronaut, if I mm -hmm. remember correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I've seen you start to like kind of float down, you know, you were done with the fizzy lifting drinks for now. <laughs> You're starting to float down back to the earth. And so I, I have enjoyed watching you. And now I, I now have the conscious awareness that this has occurred. And I would say you're speaking the truth right now. So thanks. Definitely. There's a place for both. Right. And it's really just a space elevator and being able to um, bring things down and bring things up and onto this particular plane as we go into this expansion. So you're in the walk Wonka elevator for sure. <laughs> Yes, I've got one foot here and one foot there. And there's just more balance. You know, another thing I'd like to bring up. I watch a lot of videos about hygiene and things in the past. Well, think about the human body because we are animals. We mm. smell in different places, especially like, for example, under your arms, right? There's a certain scent about that and there's a purpose for that but of course we're living in cultures now of um, many cultures not all cultures where you cover that up and mm -hmm. you stop that and sweating is also a purpose sweating is also a scent 
And, you know, you have all of these scents, especially around your private areas as well, that uh, I'm sure a long time ago, humans were a lot more connected to that body communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That way, the smells of a body would tell you perhaps what cycle a woman was uh, in her fer fertility. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that there is a physical change when a man is aroused. There's a vibration. I'm quite sure of it. And so I, I feel perhaps a long time ago, and I, I know that's so general, a long time ago, there were dinosaurs. <laughs> I can't put it, you know, it's just like kind of a middle school report just to get it done. But I don't know what time reference to put. I'm just saying like before, let's say the last 200 years, where smells became really bad and negative, you know, in different parts of the body and you wanted to be a little bit more pleasing to the nose. I mean, those, those didn't, ex I mean, you know, people had perfumes and things like that. They found evidence of that in different cultures around the world at different time periods. I get it. But for the most part, they're more connected to how the body operates biologically and how it's, how it reacts and how it smells. And it all has communication in it. Um, now, modern society, you know, we do cover it up, but we also live longer because we understand more about biology. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're living what, 80, 90 years now. And that, I, I think even the back in the time that you went back 150,000 years, I don't even know what the age span would be, but I, I would say it's probably not very long. Nope. I mean, I think 35 was like elderly in, in uh, just what, a thousand years ago, right? Yeah. yeah. And just going through my, my own family's history and it was either you died when you were like 44, 47, or when you're in your eighties, right? There's like the no man's land in between. Well, yeah. But it's interesting. And I'm thinking of Kingston and what a wonderful teacher that dog has been for me. Um, he has a lot of anxiety and a lot of fears and there are like, I would wake up because I could smell him. Right. And you could smell like, you could smell the fear. You could smell the anxiety and it's wow. like pungent. So yes. I mean, I think because we're animals as well, right. We just happen to have opposable thumbs that it would just make sense that you're, you're using all those senses. And so this is, and you and I have an opportunity, um, to, um, teach or to work with people that are, are deaf and how to access the Akashic records. We'll talk more about that offline. Um, that to me is going to be um, a significant learning experience um, as I had forgotten about that until now, um, as far as a, a connection or a correlation. But I think that's going to really um, help us learn how to communicate in non-obvious ways. As soon as you said that, I thought exactly what you just said. <laughs> like, wow, what a beautiful learning challenge. Mm -hmm. Which is where I down my alley of interest and curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> so I know this podcast has been a little bit of um, a verbal adventure. It has. I like it. <laughs> yeah and we're going to we'll, we'll start this is for the audience itself um we'll start doing our um, coaching the first week of january mm -hmm. we've got a list so we'll we'll spend um and i'll call it an, not an infinite but a, a finite amount of time you know doing those one-on-one -on -one sessions to kick off the new year and and helping individuals just become a better be a better you um any parting words, Christina, for our friends out there before we go into, is there next one before New Year? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we um, have one more. Yeah. Right. But, you know, we are actively seeking uh, someone to play with and to assist. So, yeah, please uh, speak up. 
so I'm sorry, your request was um, regarding saying something about the solstice or the new year. I'm sorry. I, I just got excited about the fact that we're about to coach people. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, ah. So no, I'm going to check, not. I'm going to check in right now and see mm -hmm. if I or other beings have something to say. To sharpen the nonverbal communication, <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to do this, but one of them is to, sorry, um, starting to get spiritually overwhelmed. I have a feeling there's a crowd waiting for me outside right now. And they're all like, <laughs> yeah, she's open. I, I, like, I'm sorry, I, it, I, it's happened again. It, it, what, this is like the fourth time this has happened during a podcast where I'm like, so just something just came in. Um, let me shake it real quick. I'll just put a pause button on that. Thank you. Okay, here we go. We're back. <clears throat> Mindfulness, 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 and mindfulness using all of your senses. And I do this a lot in channeled meditations. They actually, when I bring people who have a variety of meditation experience uh, from usually a lot of beginners, it's very, very difficult to get beginners on board. First of all, they, there's like a, an imposter syndrome and, and the, like a naivety, like, Oh, I can't do meditation. So one of the things that I'm always guided to do with them is kind of a sensory mindfulness when we go into a visualization so that they can actually interact with the visualization with all of their senses possible. And so that it all like starts turning on. So you can do this in real life as well. You can sit down in nature, on a bed, in your car and turn on those senses. And first put your hands on, you know, run your hands through the grass, uh, around the, the fabric of the bed, you know, wherever you are, start feeling the textures around you and really zone in on them. You can close your eyes, but also linking the sight, because if you do visually see, there is a power in that because we do use our eyes a lot, <laughs> almost just as much as anything else. And so if you can connect that sense of watching your hand go through the texture of uh, of surfaces that's very connecting uh, just being aware of the smell around you um, the smell of leather the smell of water the smell of smoke the smell of air anything any trace just really honing in on that is a very great exercise um, for um, hearing think about all the little minute um vibrations of of sound and energy happening around you you can hear the wind in the trees you can you know if you actually sit in your house and try to hear nothing I've done this before you actually hear a lot you don't understand how many things buzz in your house just always there's always a computer running or a refrigerator or you'll hear a car outside and these things you kind of started to shelter yourself from and you know so that you can actually get some stuff done like sleeping and important things you know it actually does detach you from a lot of things so if you were to be more aware of the things happening it's also a great thing and of course um sight we always look at big pictures and then we focus in on something like i'm focusing in on this camera right focusing on everything focusing on the camera but i'm gonna really look at the camera. I'm going to look, it's got light on it. And I'm just going to look at the details. I can see the dust on the camera lens. I can see my own reflection on one of the little doohickeys on the, on the right. Can't describe it, but I'm experiencing it right now. I'm looking at the, how the uh, tripod is, is holding onto it, how tight 
noticing how tight it is connected. So those kinds of um, minute, minute kind of uh, awarenesses and taste. I wouldn't recommend that you taste leaves <laughs> or lick your bed <laughs> or lick the leather on the steering wheel. I wouldn't suggest. Unless you're a cat. Yes, if you are a cat, you may look all of those things. Hey, listen, if you want to, that's fine. It is the world of coronavirus. Don't be licking poles outside. Don't be licking, you know. But one thing that you can do with taste to really um, turn it on is when you do eat, also a mindfulness when you eat. Mm. Um, when you do have something flavorful. And this is a this is um, something that people do when, you know, maybe they eat too much or they have lost the joy of eating in some way is they, they try to refire that sense of of taste and the texture in your mouth and things like that. And I've rambled on enough. And that this is because I'm getting this channeled information. I'm trying to get it to you. Give all of that a try. I've done it before and I've done it with other people. And this is a big first step in communicating without words. All of those things I just talked about, It's all communication to your body. Hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Chris, remember when we uh, went, we did a regression together. I took you through a regression. Uh Remember the sensory things that I made you do just to kind of like get into the world? I mean, it does help, correct? Oh, no, I don't remember. But yes, running like your, your hands to the grass, yeah, feeling the wind. You might not remember because it's all it's it's there to do. It's not supposed to be memorable, of course. It's there just to um, start to connect you yeah, with sensation. with the world e- even stronger. And it does mm-hmm. help with people with with issues when they're beginning meditation or even if they're advanced. It really does um, start to uh, um, melt the worlds together. <laughs> yeah, it, sensation is a huge, um, and just my awareness around sensation when I'm meditating and not trying to block it out, mm-hmm. right? But just acknowledging it um, has been a, a real game changer for me. And whether I'm in the records or meditating or coaching someone, and just, you know, in that awareness, not trying to tune things out or turn down the volume or focus, but incorporating that into the experience has been very powerful. Um, as you were talking, what came through for me um, was was really clear and really really clean, which was be still and know. Be still and know. <laughs> that, was, that was as clean as it gets. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. So there's be still and know that I am God. There's you know, be still and, and know, um, you know, what my feeling is about having a God that sits outside of ourselves. That it's not my, it's not my thing. Um, but be still and be aware to your point, be still and know, be still and be aware of the sensations, the feelings, the smells, the sights, the sounds, the vibration, the frequency, the energy, which could be God, could not be God. I don't know. Be still and know. Be still. It's like the solstice. Be hey. still. Yeah. Hey, tying it together. Well, today was an uplifting uh, talk for me. Definitely. <laughs> I mean, we always get something out of it, right? Yeah, but perspective. Yes, perspective. Perspective. Mm-hmm. And now all I want to do, first of all, I'm going to handle these wily spirits that we're trying to like barge in here. Got I got to deal with that in just a moment. Uh, but I also really want to do a sensory meditation. Like I'm really excited about this now because I've done it before. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, no. Yeah, I need to be still <laughs> mm-hmm. and experience those things. I, I haven't done it before for a little while. Amazing. It's um, let me know how it goes. I'm sure we'll talk tomorrow. Definitely. Definitely. Well, um, yeah, you scamper off and do you and I'll go do me and everyone. Thank you for listening. 
and um, we're still looking for someone to coach. Oh, we have some ones. I just didn't feel like doing it today. Oh, do we? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. But we still want to hear from you if you want to be coach, guys. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Great. Let's we'll keep on doing it. All awesome. right. Thanks, Chris. Christine. Thank you. Mwah. Mwah. You're the best. Bye. Bye.